Hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Spencer Rukti. I am the author events manager at Third Place Books here in Seattle, Washington. On behalf of our bookstore, I'm so pleased to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Katie Wirth and Glenn Branch. They are here to talk about Katie's new book, Miseducation, How Climate Change is Taught in America. First of all, I want you uh, to invite you to use the chat window at the bottom of your screen to say hello and let us know where you're calling in from. And also through virtual events like tonight's, uh, Third Place Books is fortunate to continue connecting readers with authors in an intimate setting. We do sorely miss having authors in our stores, but at the same time, we're thankful for the miracle of virtual events that bring our event series into your homes all across the world. So thank you for tuning in and for supporting independent bookstores. We are proud to host a number of exciting virtual events this season, which you can find on our website, thirdplacebooks.com, uh, where I also encourage you to sign up for our email newsletter for the latest on author events like the one you'll be hearing tonight. As I mentioned before, the chat window at the bottom of your screen is open and we encourage you to use it respectfully. Tonight, we also have some time for your questions. So if you have questions for our authors this evening, please submit those in the Q&A window below, which is separate from the chat window at the bottom of your screen. We also offer closed captioning for those who are interested. Just hit the live transcript button at the bottom of your window to turn this feature on or off. And without further ado, I am pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Katie Wirth is an Emmy award-winning investigative journalist and was the inaugural Frontline Columbia Toe Journalism Fellow. She was the recipient of an O'Brien Fellowship in Public Service Journalism at Marquette University. Her work has appeared in Scientific America, National Geographic, The Wall Street Journal, and was included in the Best American Science and Nature Writing of 2016. Joining Katie tonight in conversation is Glenn Branch, the Deputy Director of the National Center for Science Education. He received the Evolution Education Award for 2020 from the National Association of Biology Teachers. He has written extensively about climate change and evolution education, as well as the threats to them. With Eugenie C. Scott, he edited the anthology titled Not in Our Classrooms, Why Intelligent Design is Wrong for Our Schools. The book tonight is Miseducation, How Climate Change is Taught in America. Bill McKibben calls it exceptional reporting with truly shocking facts and goes on to write, quote, the fossil fuel industry is doing all that it can to undermine education about climate change, which will be the most important fact in the lifetimes of kids in schools today. I'm so excited to have these two authors discussing climate change education with Third Place Books tonight. Please join me in welcoming Katie Wirth and Glenn Branch. Thanks for that introduction. Again, I'm Glenn Branch, the Deputy Director of the National Center for Science Education, which works to defend and promote the teaching of socially but not scientifically controversial topics. For a long time, that meant mainly evolution. And one of NCSC's proudest moments was in 2005, when we helped the plaintiffs in a federal lawsuit, Kitzmiller versus Dover, to successfully argue that a Pennsylvania school district's requiring its teachers to recommend the latest incarnation of creationism, intelligent design, to its students was unconstitutional. But as efforts to undermine the treatment of climate change started to emerge, NCSC added climate change to its portfolio in 2012. And over the last decade, our efforts have been split about equally between fighting creationists and fighting climate change deniers. NCSA crossed paths with Katie Wirth first in March 2017, I believe, when she called her, her, our office to discuss a breaking story. The Heartland Institute, a Chicago-based right-wing think tank specializing in climate change denial, was in the midst of sending packets of climate change misinformation to tens of thousands of science teachers across the country. This wasn't Heartland's first outing, but its campaign understandably received a ton of attention because it was seen as part and parcel of a new push against climate change education emboldened by the results of the 2016 presidential election. Katie, then reporting for Frontline, somehow managed not only to break that story, but also to provide the sort of details and insights that you wouldn't necessarily expect from a reporter toiling to meet a deadline. We were impressed. Equally impressive over the next four years was Katie's subsequent work reporting on challenges to and obstacles in climate change education, mainly for Frontline. It didn't take long for us to realize that her byline was 
a guarantee of a well-written, well-researched, and well-thought-out piece of journalism. And she had her finger on the pulse. Particularly noteworthy was her coverage of a long-standing controversy over the treatment of climate change in the state science standards in Idaho, a state with half the population of the Seattle metro area, but whose students deserve to learn the truth about climate change just as much as any do. I was excited to hear that she was writing a book on the topic, and it was a pleasure and a privilege for me to endorse her book, Miseducation, How Climate Change is Taught in America, which we're virtually here to discuss tonight. So to start off, um, when Spencer held up the copy of Miseducation, you could have seen it was a slim volume. It's not a horrible, forbidding academic tone on science education. And to go with that, um, you engagingly tell a lot of people's stories in miseducation. And perhaps the most striking, I thought, was that of Iserman, the youngster from the Marshall Islands. Can you sketch his story? Well, um, a colleague of mine and I at Frontline were assigned a story about um, climate change in the Marshall Islands. And if people aren't familiar with the Marshall Islands, it's a, an island nation in the middle of the Pacific. It's sort of equidistant from Hawaii and Australia and Japan. And um, it's notable because in many of the islands, the highest point is about 15 feet above sea level. So it is very vulnerable to sea level rise. And um, so we were there and we were talking to children there and we were just really stunned by how fluent they were and how um, kind of how informed they were about climate change. They could talk about what was causing it and what it might mean for their future in a way that seemed really rare to me. And um, one of the children that you mentioned is Iserman. And um, he was a nine-year-old when we talked to him. And his family uh, was thinking of moving to Oklahoma, where they had some extended family. And um, he, uh, you know, I, they were thinking about it in part because they wanted him, him and his siblings to get the best education possible. Um, and so, you know, the question arose, well, what would he learn if he moved there? And that was one of the starting places of this book. And when he moved to Oklahoma, his education would have been governed by the state science standards in Oklahoma. Now, this phrase, state science standards, which I've used at least three times in this conversation, we'll probably use more, that's not really a household word. But you and I have both spent a lot of time with them over the years. Can you explain what state science standards are, how they're developed, and why they're so significantly, especially with regard to socially controversial topics like climate change? So um, I think a lot of people's eyes glaze over as soon as the words science or you know state academic standards um, show up, and it's because it's a very arcane bureaucratic process to develop them. But they're so interesting because they're ultimately a state's, in my opinion, and I'd love your thoughts, um, the, a state's greatest lever of control over what happens in their classroom. So a state standard is simply, you know, what a, a state expects a kid to learn by the end of a given year. Um, you know, so, you know, in fourth grade, you might learn local history or, you know, your multiplication tables. Um, and, um, and so it's interesting to see what states do and don't include because there's no national curriculum. It's all up to states. And so uh, a lot of people have, or, you know, I'm not the only one to have looked at uh, what those standards say about climate change. In fact, NCSE um, did a really incredible study of all 50 states and graded them. Do you want, do you, I'd love to hear how that study came about. Um, so the study you refer to is uh, something called Making the Grade, and we put that together last year in uh, collaboration with the Texas Freedom Network. And what we did is we recruited uh, three academics of varying backgrounds and specialties to go through and look at the treatment of climate change in the state science standards used in the 50 states plus the District of Columbia. That's not quite as bad as it sounds because 20 of those states plus DC share the same uh, science standards called the Next Generation Science Standards. Uh, that includes Washington State, by the way. Um, and of course, there's a huge spread uh, all the way from 
very good treatments, such as in the NGSS and a couple of states with very similar standards, to horrible uh, and even climate change denial infested standards, such as in Texas, for example. Yeah, and so when I went to Oklahoma to find out what Iserman might learn there, um, at that time, climate change had been very assiduously, assiduously removed from the standards. Um, they had, uh, you know, they had been considered and then um, the educators on the panel that were recommending the standards took them out because they knew that, you know, one of the, because these standards have to get approved by the state legislature. And this, they knew the state legislature would kind of control F for, for climate change. And if it included climate change or evolution, by the way, they didn't include the words evolution either in their science standards at that time, um, then they would reject them. And in fact, that's what they did. There was, still, there was still concern about it, even though there was concern about teaching weather because uh, the... Um, the state lawmaker, the, the conservative state lawmakers were worried that a teacher might use the concept of weather to teach climate change. It's a slippery slope. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I went to this high school in Enid, uh, Oklahoma, and talked to members of the um, the Islander Club there, um, five kids whose families had all immigrated from the Marshall Islands, and four of them said that I was the first adult to ever say the words climate change to them on school grounds. So, so a lot of the action is at the level of state science standards, but there are 50 states and there are about 13,500 local school districts. So there's no guarantee that science teachers in a state with a good treatment of climate change and its standards will be treating, teaching climate change well, or vice versa. So what other factors did you discover influence what, if anything, science teachers tell their classes about climate change? Well, um, the biggest predictor of what a teacher might tell their kids about or teach their student, their learners about climate change is their political affiliation, um, which is true more broadly. Um, you can roughly guess what somebody's going to think about uh, climate change based on how, how how like strongly associated they are with a given party. Um, and, but it's not that simple. There's also um, the problem of uh, teachers just not having learned it themselves. So teachers, you know, this is not something that was taught in schools until recently. And so a lot of teachers may not have the expertise or the, uh, you know, confidence to tackle this this subject that they rightly probably fear that there's going to be some pushback on in, their, in some communities. So I think teachers sometimes avoid it or they um, teach it as a debate, um, which is also problematic because we know that you're then asking children to debate something that scientists don't debate. And that can leave them with some real misunderstandings of the situation. And Washington is one of the few states that actually took targeted action to rectify the problem of the under-preparation of science teachers to uh, address climate change, right? Mm -hmm. um, they have a, there's a Washington State program called Climb Time, and um, it was created by a bill to support climate education, and they've put millions of dollars into training teachers. So in the first two years, I believe they um, trained one in five teachers in the state on how to uh, teach climate change. And that's a really powerful intervention because you're kind of going directly to the source of information and kind of this trusted relationship between teachers and children um, and giving teachers tools to talk about, to, to teach it well and to handle any um, kind of pushback that comes up or um, complications that arise. And um, only about 40% of the adult U.S. population has a college degree. So we have to keep in mind that for the majority of our fellow citizens, it's going to be middle and high school science as their last best hope to be exposed to climate change in a formal educational setting. Yeah, and I think that's why it's so interesting because, of course, people are exposed to information about climate change 
not just in schools, like they're exposed in the media and in social media and in their church and in their families. But there's something important about what happens in public schools because it's, it's like an equity issue, in my opinion, you know, like there's something equalizing about public schools. Most people in this country are touched by public schools. So, you know, if you can figure out what could, if you can teach, give kids some information and if they can absorb it um, in their in their middle or high school education, you're, um, you're, there's an equality there, you know, or an equity there. You're, you're reaching every um, future adult decision maker. Who will have to make important decisions about climate change policy in a warming future. And about so, their own lives. Yeah. Yeah. So this under preparation of science teachers and the inadequacy of instructional materials with regard to climate change has left a vacuum that climate change deniers have sought to fill with misinformation, such as, to circle back to what I was saying before, the Heartland Institute was trying to get into classrooms. But I know that you found some even more alarming instances of fossil fuel industry backed propaganda aimed at the schools. Yeah, so this is really long history of fossil fuel, the fossil fuel industry trying to get into classrooms and kind of exploit that um, trusted relationship between a teacher and their children. And like back in the 50s, the I think it was the American Petroleum Institute created something uh, like a show and tell presentation called the magic barrel about all of the miracles that are held within a barrel of oil and that you know, hundreds of thousands of students saw that or more. Um, and so every decade, there's been more and more, you know, there's been more of these um, attempts to kind of get into schools. And um, when, the when the industry started pushing climate denial pretty actively in the late 80s and 90s, um, they also started pushing climate denial in schools. And we know that because in 1998, the American Petroleum Institute held a meeting with the leaders of Exxon and, and several other fossil fuel companies. And, um, and it was specifically like a memo came out of it that was then leaked to the New York Times. And the memo, um, the, the um, memo said, victory will be achieved when the public understands the uncertainty in climate science. And that's um, duplicitous because their own scientists, we know, were not um, uncertain about climate change whatsoever. Um, and the science in general was not uncertain. Uh, but one of the tactics that they listed in that memo was uh, that they wanted to reach out to children in schools and partner with the National Science Teachers Association and other groups, which they then did um, to push these climate denial messages. And they wrote that they, this was necessary to, quote, erect a barrier against future regulation. So they saw the power of kind of getting into children's minds early, planting doubt, and then that paying off for them in the long run. I should say that the National Science Teaching Association, whatever the history has, was, is currently very good on climate change. It had a uh, very firm statement about the necessity of teaching about climate change in accordance with the scientific consensus that it put out a few years ago. And it's yeah. backed that up with providing resources and doing workshops at their conferences. And that came in 2018. So right. that, is, um, that is really late. And there was a lot of pressure for many years for them to do it sooner than that, and they did not. So I think we shouldn't let them off the hook on that regard. So you, we, we were discussing a little earlier um, what drives the kind of resistance to climate change education, and you emphasized uh, political views in particular. People often cite uh, religious views as contributing, such as fundamentalism, and there are cases in point. In 2007, for example, down the road a piece from Seattle, a parent in federal way objected to a classroom screening of Al Gore's documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, complaining, quote, the Bible says that in the end times, everything will burn up but that perspective isn't in the DVD. Well, that's true, it wasn't. Uh, but your review of the literature suggests that the situation with religion is more complex. Yeah, I, um, so 
I was really inter- I, I was really interested in this kind of connection between the history of how evolution has been taught and the more recent history of kind of controversies over climate education. And um, that the they're, they are very parallel. You know, you can look at how, um, I mean, this is something that you know far better than I did. You wrote a book on evolution <laughs> and schools, um, but, um, you know, it was, it's, it was interesting for me to learn how the, especially the effect that these controversies had on textbook makers and how they really kind of almost initially they stopped mentioning evolution because it was banned in states. And, um, and, but then they just started keeping it out because they wanted to sell their books in conservative states, even if it wasn't banned and they knew it would stir up trouble. And so that's kind of what we saw with um, climate change is that they, these textbook makers preemptively uh, watered down the language about climate change and made it really fuzzy. And, you know, I read dozens of textbooks for this for, in this reporting, and they're pretty much every one that I read um, until the very latest, gen- newest generation of them had all of this language was couched in doubtful language. Um, so it would say, um, you know, climate could have some positive effects and some less positive effects. Um, or, you know, while many scientists believe that humans cause climate change, some propose that it's natural, which was a a false statement when they wrote it and they knew it, you know, the scientists are the ones that are writing these books, um, but they, they're also a business. The company is a business and um, they were, you know, worried about selling books. And you had some adventures tracking down the actual authors of these passages. Yeah, I took one of the most popular middle school science textbooks in the country and, um, and tried to find, um, figure out who wrote that language. It was the book that said, um, well, many scientists believe humans cause it. Some scientists propose that it's natural and, you know, it has a lot of that language in it. And so I was like, well, was this written by the author? Was it an editor that put it in? Um, And it took a lot of reporting, a lot of phone calls, because these textbooks are made by probably a hundred or more people are involved in each Um, both between writers and editors and fact checkers. And what I heard was that there were a lot of explicit conversations at at McGraw-Hill at that time saying, well, we want to include climate change, but we know we can only say this and we can't say that other stuff. And we're just going to have to be very careful about how we we talk about it. I should... Explain that uh, some states uh, adopt textbooks at the state level, so they, there's one big buy for the whole state, and some uh, do it locally, so they have local discretion. So states that have that uh, are adoption states, as we say, that do the textbook evaluation and adoption process at the state level uh, have more clout. And wouldn't you know it, uh, one of those is Texas, right? And Texas as we speak, is actually going through a really interesting process um, that you know possibly more about than I do at this point, but um, the, for the first time, they're considering including climate change in their standards. And I know from talking to lots of people inside um, the publishing industry that the publishing industry pays really close attention to what is happening with Texas standards when they're that because what happens is the standards are set and then two years later a year or two later they the texas adopts a new round of textbooks so all of the publishers are kind of eagle-eyed on the process of the standards so they can write these textbooks that will sell in textbook in texas so um right now there's been this back and forth because it was proposed to include climate change Um, But as soon as it was proposed, um, the language started getting watered down. So, you know, like there was a standard that said, um, you know, humans can humans cause um, climate change, basically. And someone inserted humans can cause climate change, which is subtle, but it's different. Um, 
And, you know, there was a, a, a standard that had would have students examine the um, the outcome or examine potential solutions to climate change. And that was taken out. And the person who proposed for it to be taken out was a, um, a, a member of the State Board of Education who in his day job is an in-house lawyer for Shell Oil. Right. So to, I mean, Texas has been making some slight progress. The standards we're talking about now are for eighth grade. Um, earlier, they were revising high school standards, and they did add some uh, climate change content to uh, the biology standards, and they took out some particularly bad climate change denial language in environmental studies. Uh, but they're starting from such a low baseline that progress is hard not to make, really. Yeah, it's, um, it's important to include. So it's much better than nothing, but it's been really fascinating to watch how directly the fossil fuel industry there has like poked at the issue and, and gotten support for um, this kind of attenuation of the standard. And what's one thing that's always odd about this is that if you look at public opinion polls, such as Yale does about the um, support for climate education, it's really high. Uh, nationally, it's about 78% of respondents to the poll, um, you know, think that schools should be teaching about the causes and potential solutions to climate change. That's not much lower in Texas. Yeah, I mean, lots of conservative folks completely believe it because, you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the world is changing if you're connected to your land or community at all. And for long enough, you know things are changing and the science isn't complicated. We're pumping millions of tons of warming pollutants into the atmosphere every day, eventually the atmosphere is going to warm and the earth is going to warm. So, um, but you know, the, the trick is that you don't need very much of the population to doubt it, to stop action. And this is a um, strategy that was developed and perfected by the tobacco industry. We know a lot about that because of later lawsuits that happened and they had to, in discovery, they had to turn over a ton of documents that showed that they really very clearly and intentionally um, hired scientists to go out and say, well, we don't really know yet. You know, some people smoke all their lives and they never get cancer. So like, how can you, you know, like there were, this was a legitimate argue not a legitimate it was a often posed argument for decades and it didn't convince everybody but it convinced enough people that it delayed um, smoking bans and smoking regulation for decades and in the meantime the industry was selling cigarettes right and and it's the same tactics, but it's also, in many cases, the same actors. The Heartland Institute, for example, used to uh, put on a vigorous defense of uh, the harmlessness of tobacco. Yeah, um, there's a really beautiful and important book by Naomi Reskes and Eric M. Conway called The Merchants of Doubt. And I think it was made into a documentary, too. Um, and they really go into how looking at these, these scientists who... Have, who were in, involved in spreading denial with cigarettes and watching how they were hired by industry after industry. So like asbestos, they were denying that asbestos was a health problem. They were denying the nuclear winter theory. They were denying um, that ozone, that CFCs caused problems with the ozone layer. And then of course, when, um, when climate change came up, they were the literally the same people were doing all of this. And they were people that had some legit cred. And so they would, you know, the media would have them on because they were, they had once been important scientists and they were then spreading climate denial. And the media helps with that because of the kind of false balance and the preference for stories of conflict. Yeah. I'm sorry to my to my industry, but it's a real it's been really problematic for this and this sort of like outsized need to like be like, oh, we're fair and balanced, but to the but without actually doing the hard work of figuring out like what is actually true, you know, like our job is actually to report the truth, not to report like quote all sides of the issue when you know one side has 
uh, basically 100% consensus at this point, right, among peer-reviewed published um, scientists. Um, so yeah, that was that was a big problem for a long time. Okay. Uh, let me just plug another book for a moment, uh, The New Climate War, a new book by Michael E. Mann, a climate scientist at uh, Penn State and a member of NCSC's board of directors, suggests that climate change denial is mutating, increasingly less focused on denying the reality or the anthropogenic nature of climate change, and more on denying the seriousness of its effects or the possible possibility of taking meaningful action to mitigate or adapt to them. Does this chime with your reading of what's been going on in climate change education? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's really, it's mainly because it's really hard to deny that it's happening now, like it's right in front of our doors. Um, but, you know, you can still make a you know, kind of an, an argument that, um, that like, you shouldn't, we shouldn't be doing it, that whatever actions that we want to take won't do anything, that there might be some other causes involved, and it's complicated that the models don't work very well, and so, you know, if you don't have, like, basically real certainty that the actions that you're going to take are going to solve this, it's really hard to justify, like, completely overhauling one major pillar of our economy, right? So like, as long as there's this um, kind of like quite this effect of like, well, but will it actually, if, you know, and I saw this being fed to kids, like I was sitting in an Arkansas uh, classroom at one point and um, in walked a representative of the Ar Arkansas Oil and Gas Association, Industry Association, and she had this PowerPoint presentation um, for the kids, and some of it was legitimate information about, you know, what, um, you know, like where you can find gas and oil in Arkansas and what technology is used to take it out of the soil. Um, but then there was a whole other section that was about you know, climate change and using a lot of these arguments saying like, well, she literally said, if, if every, if we, if tomorrow we turned off every motor and stopped burning all um, fossil fuels in America, the difference that it would make to climate change would be 0.0001%, which is just not true. It was, I don't, you know, it was not true. It's just not true. And, um, and she was saying that to the kids. And the point is like, don't worry about it. We can't do anything about it anyway. And, you know, if, and then she had, you know, this whole section on like, if you stop, you know, uh, you know, using fossil fuels, you'll, people might starve more and they won't get healthcare and kind of this like other, um, this push, these other talking points that the fossil fuel industry has been pushing lately. Let me see if I can squeeze in one more question for you before we go to the Q&A. Uh, you end the book on what I can only describe as a downbeat note with you, a student in your hometown of Chico, California, though his house in nearby paradise was burned to the ground by a wildfire intensified by climate change. He writes that climate change hasn't affected his life at all yet adding, I don't know if I believe it yet. Do you see any hopeful signs uh, for improvement in climate change education in this country? Yeah, I do. Um, every school that I visited, no matter where it was, had a teacher that was kind of doing the yeoman's work of educating kids, giving kids information about their future and, um, and, and explaining what was happening. Um, and why it mattered, what it might mean for the future, and what solutions that might exist and that they could be part of. And, you know, it's hard to sit through classes like that and not feel hopeful because there's just a lot of people out there that are doing really good work. Um, and then programs like Climb Time, you know, there's like, you know, there's, there's, there is movement happening. And I'm curious, I would love to know the answer from your perspective, do you have hope? Well, I think as my previous question kind of presupposed, uh, we are seeing less outright climate change denial and we're seeing these more subtle and insidious forms. 
And they're harder to do th to work against because we start getting into um, questions about, for example, to what extent do we want science teachers to be talking about climate policy in science classes? And you know, there's something to be said for it, but there's also something to be said against it, as, including the fact that it's liable to misinterpretation, innocently or willfully, as you know, attempt to indoctrinate. So uh, we do see teachers who are kind of hesitant, uh, even in the absence of any kind of complaint, to discuss policy for fear that they be misperceived as taking a political position in classroom. Yeah, but the problem with that is that if you only give kids the doom and gloom that like, we are really screwed, and, you know, it's really bad, um, and then leave it at that, then, you know, that's not really, um, that's, that's not a complete education because there are solutions and they, we need those kids to be part of them, you know, and to be thinking them up and to be pushing for them, you know. So, um, so I, I think that a lot of the teachers, I hear, I completely agree that it can get into some kind of dangerous territory, but it seems essential in a kid's education to have that, like, there's hope um, yeah. element. Yeah, well, I think, I agree with that. I think that, but teachers need to have enough knowledge of the content to be confident in teaching it. And so that's one reason that Washington's climb time, for example, is is one of the real points of hope for me, because if we can get the teachers up to speed, teachers know how to get the kids up to speed. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. All right, well, first of all, uh, thank you so much, uh, Katie and Glenn. This has been a wonderful conversation so far. Um, I am back to speak on behalf of our attendees tonight uh, as we start, start the audience Q&A portion of our discussion. Um, so if you're out there listening, uh, you can submit your uh, questions to the Q&A window that is at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will get to as many questions here as time allows. So to start us off, uh, I have a great question here that piggybacks off of what you were just talking about. Um, an attendee asks, uh, how can climate policy and climate action um, and activism be taught to students well and defensively, uh, given that policy and action aren't necessarily um, taught alongside, you know, the science of climate change, and that can be difficult to do. Well, for example, in Texas, um, the standards are actually science and engineering uh, uh, standards. And so science gets us um, to understand what is happening. Um, it's also an essential part of any solution. And ed engineering is absolutely a part of any solution. And so I, I think that it does have a place in classrooms um, and uh, especially through that engineering lens. I th I'd also add that integrating climate change across the curriculum and not just keeping it in um, the science classroom. It's a very natural to have a discussion of climate change in social studies class. And that's a really good place actually to talk policy because policy is part of social studies. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say that at the time when I um, visited Oklahoma and it wasn't in any classroom except for advanced um, environmental science, climate change at that time was mentioned in Hawaii's standards in third grade social studies, middle school science, high school biology, US history and government, Pacific Island studies, earth science, environmental science, and one math class. And I also know that New Jersey has placed climate change in all kinds of classes. Um, it's relevant to basically every industry now. So um, it's pretty easy to put into any subject that you want. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have another attendee who asks, uh, what are students in more climate aware countries taught about climate change and how does the United States stack up? I assume not very well. Yeah, so there was a really interesting survey that the UN did actually um, and released early this year that looked at beliefs in climate, science, climate change and the climate crisis um, by generation and by country. And um, what they found is that younger generations are much more uh, willing to consider it a crisis than older generations, um, no matter where they are. 
And then it found that um, the U.S. in the U.S. about 25% of respondents aged 14 to 17 um, didn't would did not kind of rejected the idea of a climate crisis. So that's that gives you a sense of the the beliefs in that age group. Um, and to answer your question, the U.S. did worse than any other country, or that percent was higher than in any other country in Europe, in Western Europe, or or North America. Although really a meaningful comparison would be between U.S. states and other countries because of the extreme decentralization of U.S. education. In most of the developed world, curriculum is set either nationally, as in France, or at the provincial or state level, as in Canada. Yeah, I did a little bit of reporting, obviously, in the Marshall Islands, where it was mentioned constantly in education every almost every year in some of the schools that I went to, but also in Germany. And I, um, I found it so interesting that in Germany, they taught it explicitly with um, kind of ethical, moral uh, kind of emphasis. So when they taught the science, they also taught this morality, like, and we have to do something about it. And that's part of the, the, ger the German education system in general, that they do try to give um, students there this moral education um, as part of their public education. I thought that was so interesting because that mm. also, that would not be, that would not fly here. No. Uh, we have a great question from uh, Alicia who asks, uh, for educators who are teaching future teachers, what responsibility do teacher education programs have on this issue? Uh, how could your book or could your book be used as a tool for our, uh, for our programs? Um, and she adds, I'm excited to think about ways to incorporate your work in our curriculum. Um, well, thank you, Alicia. Um, I would love, um, I, I think that just literally thinking about this issue and having a conversation about it with future teachers is helpful. And, you know, like giving them some tools to navigate that pushback because, you know, I basically couldn't find a classroom where there wasn't some tension over this issue at some point, you know, between parents and teachers, teachers and administrators, students and teachers. Um, so, you know, they are likely to run into some pushback and figuring out how to gracefully and, um, but, you know, like gracefully handle that, that kind of uh, is respectful of the student and their belief, but also provides them with the data and the information that they need to make their own analysis, no matter what they're learning at home or elsewhere in their life. Um, I think that is those are tools that would serve, I mean, honestly, not just serve them about climate change, but lots of subjects now are, um, and probably always are um, the subject of a lot of debate and adult politics find their way into classrooms in all kinds of ways. Um, we're obviously seeing that right now with um, critical race theory, um, sex education, there was a big controversy in in the same standards adoption in Texas. Um, so yeah, there's lots of ways that teachers are running into these kind of cultural, um, these like adult uh, problems with their kids are, you know, they're having to deal with it with their children, with their students. Yeah, so let me add that pre-service teachers specifically need um, targeted instruction on the content of uh, climate science and in their methods classes they need targeted uh, instruction about handling uh, socially controversial socially controversial issues in the classroom and in the community and there are various education professors who are thinking hard about ways of doing this and there's active research going on that's a more direct answer um, there's a, an attendee who asks, is there a way that you think climate change can be taught that will both protect the educator and allow the educator to teach with efficacy? Um, well, so I had um, the, the, the experience that Glenn mentioned of um, when I was in, in the classroom of the kids who had been burned out of their homes in paradise. 
and they were, uh, so it was a whole classroom of climate refugees that didn't recognize that they were climate refugees. Um, and one of them raised their hand and said, um, hey, like, I don't know what to believe because my parents say that this isn't true. And I, uh, and the teacher, I felt um, just handled it so beautifully. Um, and he um, was like, well, that can be confusing when one, adult that you you know tells you one thing and you're learning something else somewhere else and you know it's hard to navigate that and you know I you're totally welcome to bring up any con any questions that you have in this class and I'm not here to tell you what to think um, I'm just here to give you the best evidence and data that I can and that's out there and we're looking at NASA data we're looking at NOAA data we're looking at temperature records and like you have all this in front in front of you and I'm just giving it to you so you can make your own analysis and I thought that was really beautiful because it it did protect the teacher he wasn't you know being ideological about it he was just saying this is science I'm giving you data we're making an analysis here you get to decide what you think um, and it was also being somewhat challenging to this, to the preconceived notions that this 11 year old had or 12 year old. The, the strategy that the teacher is using is something called inquiry based learning, where te students are kind of guided through looking at the evidence and analyzing in the way scientists would. And this has a lot of advantages and it produces uh, more enduring and stronger learning, but it also does kind of instill an appreciation of why science is trustworthy because this, kids are doing it for themselves and seeing how it works out. And uh, one of the nice things about the next generation science standards and standards similar to them is that they foster this kind of inquiry-based learning. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Lawrence asks, uh, or he says, Florida Gulf Coast University has a required environmental sustainability course for all undergraduate students, regardless of one's major. It is a graduation requirement. Uh, would you support such a policy for other universities and do you think it goes far enough? What do you think, Glenn? You know, I'm happy enough for universities to make that call themselves. Um, and presume, you know, they're competing for students. So, um, uh, you know, I think the market forces are to some extent are going to determine whether that is a good model. Um, it sounds like a nice idea to me, but you know, there, there are costs. So. Um, it makes me think of something that Frank Neopold told me. He is the kind of climate education czar at um, NOAA. Uh, and probably for the entire federal government at this point, but he um, he was talking about how he has he's talked to thousands of teachers and students about what they've learned about climate change, and he's run into a lot of kids who get to college and like make their career choice, and then you know in the third year of college are like, oh wait, you're saying that this is real, like this climate thing, and like I've been taking all these ag classes or you know, like, you know, want to be an oil field engineer or whatever, you know, and like, I have made this choice that isn't right for me or right for my future. And so there's something, um, you know, that's a disservice to that person, that young adult, to not give them information about their future. So there is something powerful about making sure that every student is aware of it and thinking of it as they consider their future. And then there's also a super interesting study that was done by Eugene Cordero at San Jose uh, State. And he did, they did this study where they looked at this class that did a really intensive, um, it was like a college course on climate change and followed them for the next several years. And um, what they found was these kids made different decisions about what cars they bought, about where they lived, about what they did with their lives. And the, he, they calculated that if, if that were kind of expanded to every student in America, the difference that it would make in terms of emissions would be as much as a rooftop solar, mm -hmm. right? Like it was, a, it was a major intervention to just tell people about it in a pretty, 
you know, in a pretty uh, robust way, it changed their decisions. And then that then changed their, um, their output, their carbon output. So that is another argument in favor of doing something like that. Okay, and uh, looks like we have one, we're gonna go with one more question for tonight and then go ahead and wrap up. Uh, this is a pretty good last question in my opinion. Um, Alicia asks, uh, where should we focus next to affect change in climate change education? Well, I, um, I actually recently just heard about um, a, a house bill that was uh, proposed by, it was house resolution proposed by Barbara Lee, I think it's HR 29, um, that would um, resolve to and fund some climate education across the country. And that was, um, that was news to me, but it also seems like a, a good start. Um, you know, and what I hear from educators is that people, first of all, just like need to know what's happening in their kids' classroom and to be paying attention. And, you know, every single year, as Glenn can tell you, there's these bills that are proposed in states all over the country um, to limit what kids learn about both evolution and, cl and climate change. And they are defeated every single year because ed science educators, um, parents, um, and the NCSE get involved and push back. <laughs> So, you know, getting involved with the NCSE or at least tracking what's happening in your state is, a, is one thing that I think can be powerful. Um, and then teachers tell me they want more professional development. You know, like a lot of teachers, like one told me, like, I barely have time in the day to pee, you know, and you want me to become an expert on this subject and like figure out how to navigate it and like giving teachers those tools is, is powerful and helpful for them. And, you know, teachers want to be engaging their students, their learners about things that their learners care about. And this is something that we know young people care about when they find out about it and, you know, and, and when they understand the science. So, you know, it's also a really powerful thing for teachers to, you know, be able to use in their classrooms. I never get my hopes up much about federal legislation on this issue because by custom and statute, the federal government has very little control over curriculum and instruction, and that's where the problem is. Uh, but I heartily agree that working at the state level to provide professional development opportunities on climate change and effective ways of teaching climate change for both pre-service and in-service educators is really important. And uh, Washington in particular has much to be proud of on this front. Well, thank you so much to both of you. Uh, we are at the end of our evening. Uh, my enormous gratitude to Katie and Glenn uh, for this vital conversation. It was such a pleasure to uh, be a fly on the wall for this. Um, Third Place Books has plenty of copies of Miseducation available online at thirdplacebooks.com or at any one of our store locations in Seattle at uh, Lake Forest Park, Ravenna, or Seward Park. So give us a call or go online and you can reserve your copy now. Um, so before we close out the night, do either of you have any uh, final parting thoughts? You should buy about th three or four copies of the book, so you'll have enough <laughs> to give away. Get them um, for your friends and your educator friends. Exactly. Uh, well, I, I think I tweeted earlier that if there's anyone in this country that knows more about climate education policy than I do, it's Glenn Branch. So it's very, um, it's really great to have this conversation with you. Um, and I'm so glad, uh, grateful for bookstores like Third Place Books for having me. Well, thank existing. you so much. Yeah. Oh, of course. We, yeah. we love existing. Uh, we, <laughs> we're, we're also very grateful we exist. All right. Well, on uh, behalf of the bookstore, um, please be well and have a wonderful week, both of you, and uh, have a wonderful week to all of our attendees. Thank you. Goodbye.